Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Room Podcast. As always, Austin Glickman, your host, with the wonderful and beautiful Eric Potts. <laughs> nope, joking. Eric, yet again, <laughs> is not here. So uh, Eric is our other co-host, which unfortunately had a flat tire coming from Jersey, wasn't able to make it. Oh, he okay. also told us that he hates the FDNY. So oh, he was like, right. I'm not coming. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> just just a joke. Eric, uh, unfortunately, not able to, to, to make it here today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look forward to seeing him in the future. Then. Yeah, yeah, abs- absolutely. So because we're going to be doing hopefully a lot of uh, stuff together. We're going to FDNY shirt. Sure. There you go. And we're, we're going to jump we're going to jump right into that in, in just a little little bit. Yeah. Um and then of course Joe Ryder, our phenomenal producer and uh, questions expert extraordinaire as as he'll throw in some questions I'm sure throughout the uh, the, the show. Yes sir. Um and of course our amazing other co-host. So, we are here for yet again another episode of the Muster Room. Who's the other amazing co-host. What's that? Who's the other amazing co-host? Well, it's you? You? Oh, me? Well, yeah, I guess me. No, not. Not the. No, yeah. Mm, I'm a pretty shitty person. I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Yeah. So, um, we are here joined for the, the episode with uh, Bobby Tully, Robert Tully. We'll call you Bobby, I'm sure, right? Yes, please. Um, from the Fire and Drums Foundation. And we are going to talk about what the Fire and Drums Foundation is. Mm-hmm. But before we even do that, Let's talk about who you are as an individual, um, how you uh, worked, or, or say your, your position in the, uh, the the military, and then of course your brother and how we you started the uh, the foundation. So we'll so, start off with my least favorite topic, which me, is me. Okay, and yep, move perfect. To my favorite topic. Let's do that. The foundation. Let's talk about awesome. you just a little bit then. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Go so ahead. Uh, me, yeah. So I was a military guy. Uh, I was in the army ten years. Uh, started off. Um, as a infantry guy and uh, decided, uh, you know, I was getting a little bit older, a little bit weaker in the knees and just wanted to do something a little bit more interesting. So got into Intel, uh, became a human intelligence collector. A simpler term is interrogator and uh, deployed to Iraq, deployed to Afghanistan, uh, went to Africa. Uh, so yeah, I had some, uh, had some experiences that uh, were good and bad as I'm sure most people would say that have deployed. Uh, but uh, it was a great opportunity, you know, very patriotic guy. I can see, yeah. Yeah, uh, very patriotic guy. And just, you know, watching on the news, guys dying every single day. You know, this is back in 2007, right? So, you know, that was like the height of the surge in Afghanistan and, and you know, guys dying every day and seeing on the news. And I just, I was like, I, I can't just sit and watch this anymore. So uh, at 38 years old, boom, I rock and rolled. Wow. So, uh yeah, and uh, glad I did it, you know, I really am. I mean, are there some regrets, of course, time away from family, um, uh, the the less wonderful experiences and, and images that are stuck with me, you know, of course, but all in all, it was, a, it was an amazing experience, and I felt like I was really contributing to protecting our country, you know, because our, our job specifically was counterterrorism. So all we did was get after the bad guy. That's all we did. You know, we didn't have patrols and, you know, cleaning up the fobs and, uh, you know, jobs that a lot of guys get stuck doing that aren't so uh, glamorous, if you will. Uh, we were fortunate in that all. That's all we did. We would deploy for four months and be balls to the wall for those four months. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing experience. You know? And how long did you serve for? Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. What was your rank? A staff sergeant. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I came home. I don't want to say I came home grudgingly because mm-hmm. my wife is going to see this and kick my ass. But uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, I I loved what I was doing because I, I like again I felt that it was relevant. You know that I wasn't wasting my time and it was important to me that if I was going to be away from family that it be worth it to do so. And I feel like that was the case. You know, and uh, my wife dealt with that and. You know, car accident, she was in a bad car accident, and I was deployed, and it took me, I didn't talk, find out until like five days later. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, you know, you can imagine how that feels, you know, being the other side of the world, and you call your wife, and she tells you that she was in a car accident, and the car was wrecked, and her neck is messed up, and nothing that you can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a very helpless feeling, you know, very, uh, very tough. That was probably one of the toughest days that I had deployed was talking to my wife about that. But she dealt with all that. She took care of the kids and troop, Boy Scout troop meetings and, and all that stuff. And she did it all by herself. And then one day she was like, I think it's time for you to come home. And I said, uh, okay. You know, the least I can do is 
agree with that, you know, after all she's been through. So, um, you know, serendipity, because I came home in May of 2016, and uh, April of 2017 is when my brother was, was you know, died. Um, so I had 11 months of being at home and hanging out with my brother and going out for cigars and just being brothers again. And, you know, um, yeah. Tell us about your so relationship with, with your brother. <laughs> we were close, very close, probably as close as you can be as brothers. Um, again, with geographic times, sometimes geography getting getting in the way. Uh, and I think that was a function of us because we, of, of how we grew up. So we grew up moving a lot with my dad's career. You know, he was like a warehouse manager kind of guy. So, and for health reasons, I had a lot of like allergies as a kid, really bad asthma. Uh, so a combination of everything, we moved a lot. Like every two years we were moving. So we never really were able to establish roots of a neighborhood and childhood friendship and all of that. So all we had was each other, man. You know, my brother and I, five years apart, almost five years. But uh, it didn't matter, you know, because we did everything together, you know. And, you were the uh, oldest brother? Yes, yes. So he's, he, he's five years younger than me. Um, and yeah, that was kind of, that kind of, I think, set the path for the rest of our adult lives that mm -hmm. we were going to be close and uh, very grateful for that. And what year did Billy get on the job? 2003. So he was, uh, he had 14 years on. So tell us about the job. So for, for those who, who don't know anything about fires and drums, sure. just tell us a little bit more about, about your brother, uh, his, his career, his, his, his lifestyle. Yeah, so my, my brother, I think, always wanted to be a fireman. He was a volunteer in Hicksville for several, several years and uh, had to wait on, get on the list like everybody else and wait. And then he got called for his number. And uh, I remember the day that he uh, got his, uh, you know, his assignment or whatever to go to the Rock and start training and uh, speaking with him and how excited he was, you know. Um, yeah, 2004. Yeah, I was, I was still here in New York, so I was able to celebrate that with him. I was able to attend his graduation. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, yeah, he was so excited because that's what he always wanted to do. And now he was living his dream. So he got on and uh, was assigned to Tower Ladder 135 in Glendale, Queens. And uh, Myrtle's Turtles? Yes, exactly. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Myrtle's Turtles. Yeah. That's funny, Myrtle, it's like orange. What rhymes with Myrtle? You know? <laughs> <They> were <laughs> yeah. a little bit limited to right. what they can run with, you <laughs> yeah. know? So, uh, no, but uh, they're amazing. I'll talk about them in a bit. But, um, yeah, with, with Billy, yeah, so he got, a, he got assigned to 135 and uh, started his career. And he was, he was that guy. I didn't really know a lot about his professional life because he was quiet. He was kind of, he was like me. He didn't really like to talk about himself and what he does or what he did, you know. So... I learned a lot of this after he died uh, from the firehouse and from guys and other firehouses that had worked with him. And he was that guy that loved his job. He, you know, when they were when they had downtime, he wasn't sleeping. He was cleaning the fire truck. Um, he was, you know, working with the probies on doing different things, or he was learning something from the more senior guys. Like he was. He was all about that job, you know. And uh, that's a source of pride for me, you know that. Because uh, you, you can't control what other people do, and you know you want to be able to be proud of your siblings and what they do for a living. And I can certainly say without, uh, without any doubt that I'm you know, very proud of who he was as a, as a fireman and what he accomplished. Uh, and in his off time, he was a heavy metal drummer for a band called Internal Bleeding. Yeah, I, 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 never get a, I, I still laugh about that name, you know. <laughs> so a uh, death metal band. And... Um, had success with that. A know? pretty popular band, if I must say. Yes, yes. And within that genre, uh, they are like probably a top five band in that genre. Yeah. They've traveled the world. Uh, he played, uh, the band played in Malaysia, uh, I think Japan, um, all over the United States, most of the states in the state in the United States, uh, Europe multiple times, uh, Russia. So, yeah, he, uh, he, he got around and... Um, I learned a lot more about that that community too, because even that community, even though everybody's separated again geographically, uh, they all kind of came together to support any way they could the family when Billy died. And um, to this day, I you know I get messages and texts from people all over the all over the world reaching out. Hey, Bobby, how you doing? How's the foundation? Keep oh. it up. 
you know, you know, we had a donation from a death metal band in Japan called Kayazugi Vomit, I think, <laughs> or something along those lines, yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, it was just pretty awesome, you know. Uh, a fireman in Iran uh, reached out to me uh, right after Billy passed, and somehow they were able to get his photo off the internet somehow. I didn't think they had access to the internet in that <laughs> yeah. country, you know. Yeah, yeah. But they got a photo of my brother, um, downloaded it, and made a banner. And he sent me a picture of wow. his firehouse somewhere in Iran yeah. holding this banner, you know, dedicated to the memory of William Tolley. I think and it just shows the, the brotherhood. You yes. know, it's the, the same thing with law enforcement, military, I'm, I, sure. I'm a, I would have guessed. You know, it stretches literally across the world. When, you know, you go to another country, I think especially if firefighters, uh, you know, when you say I'm a firefighter, and in New York City firefighter, I mean, like, yeah. top, best of the best, it right? It a lot of weight. Exactly. It does, yeah. And, you, you, know, and you know, you go across the world, and there's a, that's a special connection, that bond, that brotherhood mm -hmm. that many other professions don't have. Absolutely. So that, that's really cool to hear that, that yeah. you know, that, that happens. Yeah, it was um, pretty awesome. What year did you join the military? 2007. So you you joined the military in 2007. Uh, Billy gets on the fire department in 2003. Correct. So essentially, uh, a few years after 9/11, mm -hmm. what did 9/11? How did that play a, a part with you joining the military and, and Billy, you know, joining the FDNY? So Billy was already on the path. You know, for me, I was I was kind of floating around different jobs and didn't really have a path. Um, and then you know, nine eleven occurred. So Billy, uh, you know, I made reference to earlier to him being a Hicksville, you know, volunteer. Mm -hmm. So on nine eleven, uh, the night of September eleventh, he was in Manhattan, and I have a I didn't bring it with me, but I have a, a picture of him at Ground Zero. You know, he had the, you know, he had the the the, the insight to bring like one a little portable camera, and he had somebody take a, a photo, and um, I have that of him, and I think that I can't speak for him obviously, but uh, I think that probably gave him even more drive than he, he might have had before um, to see what happened there and knowing that his path was going to make him one of those firemen in the future and. Uh, it certainly stuck with me as well. It stuck with all of us, you know. I mean, anybody that, you know, whether you're patriotic or not, I think 9-11 impacted everyone equally. You know, I just think that people were that maybe were a little bit more patriotic or, or driven to serve probably were impacted a little bit more and chose a path of law enforcement or first responder of some kind or the military, of course. Uh, so, yeah. Your parents must have been really proud of seeing, you know, both their sons, one I, yes, being a fireman yeah, and one being in the so. military. Yeah. The, um, I, I think that was really a double-edged sword for them because I'm sure that for a period of time when I was in the military and deployed and Billy was deploying every day as, as a fireman, uh, I'm sure that brought some challenging times for them too, you know, being nervous about what would go on. And, you know, my dad was very much a... Uh, you know, he was like a doom and gloom guy, like, oh, it's coming, you know, the end of the world, the kind of, it's just how he was. And uh, my poor wife, you know, he would see something on the news about an explosion in Iraq and guys dying. Yeah. So what would my dad do? He would call my wife and be like, have you heard from Bobby? I'm like, dad, you, you gotta yeah, stop. Don't do you that. Know, don't do that. Yeah. He, it was harmless. He didn't, yeah, yeah, he didn't mean anything course. by it, you know? So I could, I, I could imagine him watching the news and seeing a fire in New York City somewhere and doing the same thing. That, that's, that's any family. Yeah. You know, I, I work in Queens now in the Rockaways, and anytime there's a shooting anywhere in Queens, it doesn't have to be the Rockaways, right. automatically, my grandma, my parents, you yeah. know, are you okay? Phone, phone starts blowing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, that's, that's, that's every family has that, you know, sure. that concern for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so Billy gets on in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, talk, let's talk about his career a little bit or, or what you know of it and then up until, the, of course, the, the incident. Sure. So he, uh, yeah, the Myrtle's turtles were great, you know, took him in, um, showed him the ropes because, you know, as you know, I'm sure it's the same thing with law enforcement. You learn more on the job than you do in the academy, right? So the, the academy gives you, I guess, the, the foundation of what it is to be a fireman, but you really learn the in, ins and outs of the job on the job and uh, he uh, he did he learned uh, learned to how to become a fireman uh, I guess he had some good um, uh, you know role models there to look up to senior guys that you know took him under their wing and showed him the right way of doing things and you know he he imported he took it upon himself later on in his career to do the same thing with the young guys that were coming in after him 
And uh, he, he actually wound up going to a different firehouse for, for just about a year. Uh, he went to engine 302, ladder 155, the Viper's Nest. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to do something just a little bit different, you know, be it a little bit, you know, someplace with a little bit more activity going on than, you know, what the Turtles had at the time. And um, for him, it, I think it was kind of like he thought the grass was greener kind of scenario, right. you know, um, because he got there and, you know, they were great and everything was fine, you know, but I think he just realized that he left a family yeah. to go to something different. And uh, he realized that it was a mistake. And and uh, after about a year or so, ended up going back to the Turtles and uh, stayed there and um, excelled in his career. Uh, at one point, he was he was looking to get into the FDNY SOC, uh, you know, Special Operations Command, and I'm not sure what he was going to do. Like it was, a, it was something that was still like in the works at the time. Uh, and he also became a member of the ceremonial unit, which was a, a big source of pride for him. And uh, something I, you know, I have to say, unfortunately, I didn't really understand what ceremonial was uh, until it was too late. Yeah. You know, I really didn't understand who they were and what they did, and I couldn't really appreciate it as much. And uh, you know, I, I wish I had at that time understood what it meant. But again, my brother being who he was, he wasn't like, oh, this is like such a big thing. He was just like, oh yeah, bro, I got into ceremonial, you know, it's a cool thing we get to do. And I was like, I was happy for him, but yeah, uh, now I know how amazing that organization is, that, that group of guys, you know, Lieutenant Joe LaPointe and um, all the guys in, in that unit, like, you know, they volunteer, they go there, and all they do is provide support for families during funerals. And they, you see the job that they do, unfortunately. The send-offs uh, that they provide are amazing, you know, because uh, they have had too much practice at it. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but he was, he was very happy to be a part of that, you know, and uh, for a very short period of time. Uh, I think he only had been doing it for about a year um, until he died, but I know that's something that meant a lot to him. and. Yeah, so he he had a, he had a full career, you know. Yeah, cut short. So let's let's talk about it. You know, let's. Yeah. I know it's, it's probably tough to talk about, even though it's so many years later. Yes, let's let's talk about you know sure. the, the incident. Okay, so April seventeenth, uh, I think it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. There was a fire in a five-story apartment complex, um, and it was confined to I think at the time one of the apartments. But my, they worried about it spreading, of course. And um, again, not still fully understanding the nomenclature and how they speak. I think, if I remember correctly, they were actually third due house. So in other words, the firehouse that would have been responsible that, for that fire was at a different call. The second house that would have taken over was at a different call. So third on the list was the Turtles. Mm -hmm. So they got called to, to head down there. Um, so they went down there and um, figured, you know, saw what was going on. So my brother, being a, <coughs> excuse me, being a 14 year guy, as a more senior guy, um, they have seniority, so certain jobs are kind of like expected that the junior guys would handle, you know, like any other job, yeah. really, you know, you put your time in. And so <clears throat> they were supposed to, you know, the battalion chief showed up and said, hey, let's get somebody up on the roof to do some ventilation. Uh, that's a job that normally one of the more junior guys would have handled, but I guess they had other things going on. So my brother being my brother wasn't like, I'll go grab a junior guy. He's like, I got you, chief. So climbed into the bucket and up he went. So at some point, uh, while they were while he was up in the bucket, um, there's like an L bracket underneath that got stuck, like on the parapet of the roof, and um, so he unhooked himself because you you have to be hooked in inside the bucket, right, while it's moving. So he unhooked himself to try and look and see and you know get some visual cues as to what was going on. Um, the the guy the chauffeur the guy that sits on the pedestal and operates from the from the from the vehicle he was also trying to figure out what was going on and you know moving the joystick or whatever and uh, at some point the hydraulic pressure built up and the bucket released from where it was caught and just shot up in the air and ejected ejected Billy out and uh, fell five stories onto the sidewalk and um, yeah. It, uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was that, and um, 
everybody immediately came to him. There were paramedics on scene, uh, but uh, you know, it, it didn't matter, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, what sticks with me is that they were there with him, and I take some comfort from the notion that my brother died loving what he loving what he did, you know? Uh, not many people get to say that, you know? Nobody wants to die, uh, but if you can go out, you know, fighting a fire, uh, you know, there's, uh, I guess there's probably worse ways to go, you know? At least it was for, for a good reason, you know? Like he didn't get hit by a bus crossing the street or something, you know? Right. He, he, uh, he died while he was doing his job, a job that he loved, and his, his, his firehouse brothers were there with him um, in his last moments, so. Um, that that matters to me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard that <clears throat> said multiple times. We, we've interviewed families of you know law enforcement and EMS and fire military, um, and of course with the organization that we run, spoken to, God, probably hundreds of by now of families, and um, every time they say at least he you know or she passed away doing something that they they loved yep. um I, I mean i probably would would i would rather go out that way than you know contracting cancer or something along those sure, lines right sure, you know yeah. so nobody wants to go out that way right. they want to go out in a, a hail of bullets i was gonna say right yeah like a, bla a blaze of glory you know, no pun intended right yes, but, or exactly. kind of pun intended i guess kind of yeah, yeah in a good way yeah in a good way yeah, yeah so i'm, I'm sure. sure i'm sure that uh yeah, but if he if he had the option to choose, it's probably you know how hundred percent, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. So. Both of us kind of lived that life, you know. And uh, it, you, one of the things that I struggled a lot with, you know, like you know, like they have the different phases of grief, you know, your denial and anger and bargaining. And my bargaining thing was that I was like I didn't understand that I was the one that was not in a casket. It wasn't supposed to be my brother. It was supposed to be me. Yeah. You know, because when I deployed, you know, I touched briefly on it and I was not careful, you know, when I deployed. Um, sorry, love. <laughs> uh, now, she kind of knows this already, but I was not careful. I was I put myself out there. I was fucking balls to the wall because I was driven to accomplish the mission, you know, and all that entails, you know. So all the chances that I took, all the risks that I took, and yet I still came home. And my brother doing his everyday job did not. And uh, I fucking struggled with that, dude. Big time, you know. Uh, that, that one really kicked my ass. Um, it's still with me a little bit, but you, a time goes on and you kind of view things from a, through a different lens, you know. So I don't really hold on to that too much. I just kind of figure that things are things that happened to happen the way they were supposed to for some reason you know part of the big plan of karma or god if you believe or whatever the case may be and mm -hmm. i've come to accept that you know whatever happens with everybody you are where you're supposed to be that in that particular moment you know yeah i, I agree with you um not a religious person but I, I believe that things happen for a reason sure uh so i i agree 100 with what you're saying right now yeah um as Part of the the podcast, we we talk a lot about mental health mm -hmm. and Very uh, important, yeah, overcoming you know major incidents in, in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, how after Billy's death, how did you cope with it? How, what did you do to to bring you to where you are today? Well, honestly, probably for the first three weeks or so, I was just a shit show and I was a complete mess, man. In all, all honesty, it took me a while to even start to function. It did. You know, uh, I really thought that my experiences in the military would have prepared me somewhat or lessened the blow. And no, it did not at all. You know, uh, it didn't. It, uh, it still kicked my ass. But then <clears throat> the FDNY, as amazing as they are, and family assistance, uh, they said, hey, listen, we have a counseling unit uh, that we can make available to you. And uh, initially I was like, like every other dude, right? Like, get, get the fuck out of here about counseling. I don't need that. And uh, after a few days of thinking about it, I was like, yeah, you know what? I should do that. And uh, started going every week and sitting down with a counselor and just talking about what happened and talking about my brother and some of the stuff that I've shared here today and my feelings. And um, I'm grateful for it. And I think it was a benefit. I think it helped. And uh, the other thing was the foundation, which I know we'll get into a little bit. So those were the two things for me that I think really helped get me through and helped me grow from that experience. 
So how long after Billy's death did you actually start firing drums? Uh, so we were officially on the books in September of 17. So it took uh, five months. That's actually really quick. It is. It uh, is. Because, uh, yeah, that was the, my new mission in life. Yeah. The fucking world was going to know William Tolley's name and who he was. Yeah. If it killed me, they were going to know him. You know? That's and actually I was that's super quick. It, you know? So, yeah, I didn't want to mess around. Yeah, no, you definitely didn't. And I felt, again, going back to the mental health aspect, I felt like this was therapy for me. Yeah. It gave me something positive to focus on related to my brother that wasn't uh, sad. You know, so I ran with it. So walk us through the the, the process of, of you, you know, sitting down and saying, I, I want to honor my brother in some way. Yeah. So how did you come up with creating a, you know, a, a nonprofit and what was the, the overall mission of the nonprofit? So uh, the primary thing, I think, again, was that the world would know who he was. So that was mission number one for me. And then I, so I, then I sat down with, with my wife and we started talking about, okay, how do we accomplish that? What can we do? Well, we could start a foundation, you know, a nonprofit and do give something back. Okay, yeah, good idea. Because um, I wanted it to be longer lasting too, you know, versus having something named after him or whatever, you know. Great, so there'll be some exposure for a short period of time and then the new cycle moves on to the next shiny red object, right. you know. So I wanted it to be lasting. So the foundation idea got started, and then because of personal experience, uh, seeing what the families go through, uh, I had a a uh, a good insight, uh, an insider's view of what may be needed for supporting the first responder uh, community, and that was non-line of duty incidents. Um, a line of duty death or severe injury, as you guys both know, uh, the families are well taken care of, as they should be. At least here in New York. Yes. Yeah, yeah other, other parts of the country nation, could be very different, yeah. Sure, I can imagine that it's a different scenario, but at least here in New York, fortunately, uh, they are in a position that they can take care of the families very well financially. Yeah. And, uh, whatever amount, type of support they need, the firehouse or the precinct, I would assume probably they, they come together, oh, yeah, they absolutely. circle the wagons to yep. support the family as well. So there's a lot of support there, as again, as there should be. But when there's an online of duty death, um, that's a different scenario. The, yes, the firehouse or the precinct is still going to be there, of course, uh, but financially it's a different thing because a non-line of duty death, there isn't the pension. So that that's gone. Um, the benefits last for a certain amount of time, I think. I'm not sure how exactly how long they have benefits for, but um, they only go so far, uh, especially if it's a catastrophic injury, not a death. Now you have medical bills and, you know, we all know we all have health coverage, but not everything is taken care of. You yep. know, you start laying, you know, co-pays and all that shit. So we decided that was going to be our niche. That's where we were going to come in as a foundation and raise money and hopefully be able to give money to those families that weren't going to have the same type of support that line of duty families did. And uh, that's what we've been doing. Um, one example of non-line of duty would be, uh, I think it was uh, about a year and a half ago or so, there was a fireman... Uh, firehouse in the Bronx they were having like a boys weekend away and they ch chose to go upstate to go like snowmobiling and stuff it was the middle of winter and um, they were out playing around whatever having fun and and uh, firefighter Carmine Barisi was on a snowmobile and crashed into something whatever I don't know the specifics and and died so because it was a boys weekend away it was not on the job that you know that certainly impacts uh, what his family was going to be eligible for uh, dramatically. So you know we we heard about this and we're like okay you know the bell is wrong this is where we now step in. So uh, we got together and and uh, we had some money raised and we were fortunate enough to meet with Carmine's widow. Um, and that's that's never an easy thing. Uh, we've done that several times. Um, met with the widow of a fireman. Um, just to let them know. I mean, we could just put a check in the mail and send it to them, but it's too personal of a thing for that. You know, I want to sit and meet with them and let them see and see in my eyes that when I say that um, that foundation is here for you, they they know it to be true. Mm -hmm. You know, so sitting across from her at the firehouse kitchen table, uh, as hard as it is, um, 
you know, it's something that I'm glad that we get to do, you know, that we have that opportunity to hand her a check to help ease the, the burden a little bit. You know, it's never going to bring back Carmine, um, but at the very least, she'll have some measure of, of comfort and support. How many families have you helped thus far? Uh, so I think we're up to over, I, I don't know the exact number, but over a dozen now that uh, we've been able to help in different ways. Um, and not just here in New York. Uh, we sent a, we weren't, we weren't able to travel, so this was one example where we didn't do it in person, but there was a family down in North Carolina, a firefighter who was retired, sick from 9-11, uh, but something happened where it was COVID related and something where the insurance wasn't covering what was going on with yeah. him, so it wound up wrecking his lungs. He needed a double lung transplant. Um, he had a business going. He couldn't run the business now. He was so sick. So his his wife uh, found out somehow about fires and drums, probably researching resources out there, and came across our foundation and sent us a message via the, the, the website. And uh, we looked into it and, and uh, spoke to her at great length and wound up sending them a, you know, a check for $10,000 uh, to help, again, to help alleviate you know, the cost of what they were going through. So it's, uh, we're starting to spread a little bit, which is good. That's great. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what we do. And yeah. uh, it's, been, it's been fulfilling. And, and, and what matters to me is that they have a shirt or a coin or a business card or even the check that has Billy's name on it. So they see that, they see Billy's name, they know who Billy Tolly is, and mission accomplished. We have the same issue in with Leo Weekend, sure. is you know getting the information out there to Got the it. people that need it. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we are growing you know quite substantially on social media, but uh, it's not often where we have a family actually reach out to us. Right. It's starting to happen more often, yep. but not nearly as much as we would like for it to happen. Of course. Uh, you're going through the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. So. Let's give a plug right now. How do people find Fire and Drums online or social media? Sure. So this being the 21st century, that, that ugly monster being social media is a vital part. Uh, something I never had prior to 2017, you know. Uh, but yeah, so Facebook, uh, Fires and Drums Foundation is on Facebook. Uh, Fires and Drums Foundation is on Instagram. And of course, we have a website. It's firesanddrums.org. Um, yeah, anything you want to know about the foundation is on the website. We put everything on there. We have pictures. We, we share stories about families that we've helped. Uh, we provide information on ways that uh, they can help support our mission and what we do. And, um, yeah, so uh, we try to make it as accessible as possible. But, again, if you don't hear about it, word of mouth, as you know, is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's tough. Um, can people donate on the on the website? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so there's different pages, but right up top is is a link to cl click there. You know, click on that, donate now. And um, websites being what they are, I'm I'm not a web. I had to learn a lot of this stuff on the fly. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you click on the link, it actually takes you to a Square Up page, which is a online um, source method of accepting like credit card payments, right? Yeah. So it'll take you to actually a different site that's still ours, uh, but that's like our online store. Mm -hmm. So on that website, you can either just make a cash donation, which is great, thank you very much, or if you wanna buy, we have all different t-shirts, different logos on there. Um, we sell challenge coins, um, hoodies, uh, and then the latest thing that we have is these really awesome glasses that have, have you seen the, the glass that has the bullet in the glass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that company does all different things. So I reached out to them because I saw one day they make a glass with a little fire axe. Mm in the glass. That's cool. I'm like, this is like meant to be. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's that awesome. wasn't calling to me, I don't know what is. Uh -huh. you know? So I reached out to them and uh, they were great. They worked with us. They gave us you know, discounted price on everything. So we have rocks glasses, wine glasses, and beer pints. That's cool. It has the foundation logo on it mm -hmm. uh, with Billy's name and the fire axe in it. That's awesome. And yeah, it's great, man. So we, uh, so we sell that stuff and all of that money goes right into the, right into the coffers, you know, and um, Another thing I want to mention that's important because I know some people ask, it's just me and my wife. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't take any money out of that. You know, I don't pay myself. There's no consulting fees, none of that. Uh, when I do have to spend money, I do it very grudgingly because it's, that money is not my money and I take that very seriously, yeah. you know? So everything that comes in goes back out to where it needs to go. 
That's fantastic. And I, I know that you guys also host fundraisers. We do. So we actually, usually we do one big fundraiser each year. Like this is like our big show. And um, back in 2017 and 18, we were trying to figure out, okay, what do we want to do? Um, as you know, at least here in New York, Long Island, New York City based, a lot of fundraisers are like Mulcahy's, yeah. right? Or golf outings. Mm -hmm. Those are like the two big things. And they're awesome. But I wanted to stand out a little bit. So, uh, you know, my brother enjoyed shooting, like I do, uh, firearms. And uh, so I wanted to do something connected with that, you know, and just be a little bit different. So we do something, we do sporting clays shoot, which is like uh, skeet shooting, you know, like you know, pull, boom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, except this is a little bit different. A sporting clays is where you actually walk a course. Um, through the woods and each station the shooting is a little bit different you might be up in a, in a tower or down on the ground and the birds come in a different direction so it's a little bit more interactive and uh, somebody made the comparison one day it's like oh it's kind of like golf and I said yeah but for men <laughs> I mean yeah <laughs> so yeah. that became our catchphrase so everybody that registers gets a free t-shirt uh -huh. and on the front is the logo for the shoot and on the back in big bold letters it says it's like golf but for men that's great yeah that's uh, awesome. nothing against people that like golf you know <laughs> just uh, having a little fun with it I've and, never gotten um, skeet shooting but uh, I, that sounds so awesome that sounds yeah. like a lot of fun it's, it is it's, it's a great day because we've uh, been able to get uh, some bigger companies to support us um uh, Vortex Optics uh, supports us every year. They send us items That's to great. raffle off. Uh, Kimber USA, mm -hmm. they used to be in the Yonkers. I think they're in Texas now. Uh, Kimber donates a 1911 to us that they engrave with the foundation and everything. Oh, nice. Yeah, every year they've uh, they've helped us out with that. Um, Magpul, you know, sends us a bunch of gear to to raffle off. So we have some big companies out there supporting, sponsoring us. Yeah. And uh, smaller local companies as well. Uh, Campsite Sports up in Huntington. Those guys are great. They always help us out with transfers and stuff. And uh, yeah, we get all sorts of route. PC, I, I don't want to forget, PC Richard. Um, we met an into we met a gentleman who is a manager of one of the PC Richard stores, and he was all about supporting what we were doing. So they donate Yetis and TVs and all sorts of stuff to us every year that we raffle off. So the raffles are a big part of what we do with the, that day. Uh, but all um, FDNY ceremonial comes out. Uh, bagpipers will come out. Um, ceremonial will take care of breakfast in the past for us. Uh, we get local businesses to donate food, and they do it right. They do. I, unfortunately, I've I've had the experience um, to <coughs> eat their breakfast, and what I mean by that is the reason I'm eating their breakfast is because the ceremonial is out mm -hmm. for a funeral, yeah. and they come to all the NYPD funerals. Yes. Uh, they I I they've I think they've also gone to other funerals from other parts of the, of the area as well, and uh, hands down. FDNY does it so much better <laughs> than yeah. anybody else. Because they're all Gavons. You know? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> they crazy. They guys. take up a huge area. They have multiple tents and yeah. grills going, and and it's they do a phenomenal job. I mean, I they, they really with them when yeah. I can. And uh, one of the times I did was for the 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 funeral. The, the I guess they had the two funerals for the two police officers. Mora and Rivera. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right there in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So. Um, things like that, we try to help out too. Yeah, you know that's not that's less a foundation thing more than a me thing. Right. You know, just a way to another way to give back. And now, don't you standing also there a... wearing, you know, wearing a an FDNY apron and yeah. being all greasy and sweaty and serving food to police officers in uniform that mm -hmm. are there to honor one of their fallen um, is a great thing. It, it, yeah, it is. And they, again, they do a great job. They now, do. you guys also have a uh, recently a, the the playground. Uh, yes, yeah. So that that uh, that was pretty cool. Um, so my brother Street, uh, my my sister in law and my niece still live there. Um, so on that street is one of those small like community parks. Uh, so it's not like um, nobody like works there. You know, it's just a small neighborhood park. Yeah. And there's like a couple of playground sets on there, a basketball court, and it it had fallen to disrepair and not looking so good. So one day I was over there visiting with them and walked over to the park. And just looked around and light bulb kind of went off. And I said, hmm, what if the foundation makes a donation, spend some money to reinvigorate this park and have it rena have it named? Because it actually didn't have a name. It was Beth Page F F6 or something like that. Right, it was right. what it was, its name. So 
we reached out to the town of Oyster Bay, uh, the officials, you know, uh, Mr. Saladino and mm-hmm. all those guys, yep. and uh, they were all about it. Yeah. So uh, we made that happen and got together with them. And we started doing some research and came across a company that makes a playground set that looks like a fire engine. And I was like, ah, this is perfect. This yeah. is amazing. So I reached out to them and coordinated with them. Uh, my wife played the, she kind of, she played the, the lead role on that. And hours and hours of phone calls and emails and, you know, the logistics behind it and get everything set up. And uh, it was, uh, it was challenging, you know, because then we had to get a bunch of volunteers together to actually put this thing up. And a lot of sweat and tears over the weekend, but we got it done and we had a nice dedication ceremony. It was on News 12 and and uh, that's really cool. So now there's a big sign there that doesn't say Bethpage F6. It says William Nicholas Tolley Memorial Park, dedicated to all first responders. That's awesome. It is. I remember that day. I was yeah. I was at the firehouse, at the Bethpage Firehouse, oh, okay. the day that you guys yeah. did the dedication. And mm-hmm. we, we uh, brought food to you, uh, for yes, you guys afterwards. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So Leo Weekend really came through for us on, on a day that was very important. Yeah. So I want to I wanna kind of tell the story about how we met to begin with. Yeah, please. Um, and again, like I said earlier, I'm a big believer of things happening for a reason. So uh, prior to me now working in the Rockaways, I used to work at police headquarters. And I was in personnel. And uh, my lieutenant at the time, uh, Lieutenant Jason Liff, knew about my organization and what, and what I did. Um, and you know, he always let me off whenever I needed the day to go do things for the families of fallen and injured officers. And uh, our uh, other board member, Kevin Bernstein, mm-hmm. uh, who also happens to be a FDNY firefighter in Ladder 135. Yep. He, we were, I don't know, hanging out one day, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to this, you know, this, this skeet shooting uh, fundraiser for a guy that, you know, passed away in our firehouse. And I was like, oh, dude, that sounds awesome. Because, you know, Kevin's a big gun guy, and we all are. We're all big gun, gun guys. And he's like, you should come. And I was like, I got, you know, I'm working or whatever was going on. I, I couldn't, I couldn't go. And um, he was like, all right, man, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about it. I'll send you some photos and stuff. I said, awesome, sounds good. So I think I go to work like the next day or the day after and I'm talking to, to Jason and he's telling me how he's going to be going to this uh, the skeet shooting fundraiser. And I'm like, what? what th- there's no way that there's two different like skeet shooting fundraisers <laughs> yeah, going what, on. What the odds yeah, that, what's the odds yeah. of that? So I'm like, I'm like, is, is it for a, is it for a firefighter that, that passed away? And he was like, yeah, he was like one of my best friends. And I was like, wait, hold on. So then we start talking more and more, and now I'm, I definitely put it together, and I'm like, it's, it's, the, it's, the, same, it's the same fundraiser. Mm-hmm. So I, I call Kevin, I put him on the phone with, with, with uh, Jason, and I think they spoke, and then I see a photo the next day or the day after of them at the, the fundraiser together, and I saw, I think you guys took a big group photo. Yeah. And they were like, you know, right next to each other. And then Kevin was telling me about the, the playground that was that was up and coming. Mm-hmm. And uh, I spoke to, to Jason about it too. And I was like, hey, we should like, I don't know, we should donate food or something. We wanted to get involved. Sure. And we did. We, and we, you know, we brought food. You know, I think it was, I don't know, a few months later, I think you ended up doing the, the playground dedication or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, it's just a really small world yeah. that Jason, my lieutenant, was in the same band as Billy. Now, they also grew up together. No, they just knew each other. It's from just just from the band, through the band, band, band from the metal, the metal community. Yeah, the metal community in right. internal bleeding, yeah. which I still think is such a funny name. <laughs> it is, it's great. And and then you know, one becomes a police officer, one becomes a firefighter. He becomes my lieutenant, and then Kevin ends up in the same firehouse as Billy was in. Like, what a small world. Yeah. That multiple connections yep. to, to the same organization. Multiple spokes on the wheel. Yeah, which uh, is absolutely. pretty pretty crazy. It is. Right? So there's actually three people mm-hmm. all in the same group, all knew Bill well, I didn't know Billy or neither did Kevin, but all had a connection to him in some way, shape or form. So it was it was uh, three degrees of Kevin Bernstein. Yeah, Instead actually, well, no, three three degrees of Billy of Billy actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I just think again, just crazy small world, yeah. and and then and then also you end up having this foundation. Mm-hmm. So it was just I don't know. It was like eye opening. Yeah, it was meant to be. Honestly, yeah, it, was, it was it was it was meant to be. So I just wanted everyone to understand that's how this all came came about in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's crazy. It, it really is. It, it is crazy. So wh- when is the next uh, fundraiser, the next skeet shoot? So skeet shoot, we usually do every year at the same time. So it's June 9th, Friday, June 9th this year. We're going to be here. Uh, typically, 
that's during our uh, Leo weekend event in Lake George. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, we actually had to suspend it this year because of uh, low turnout. We're doing a cruise to the Bahamas. Everybody signed up for the cruise to the Bahamas in November, and because of the way the economy is, we think it had a significant impact on people not wanting to do multiple different, you know, um, getaway vacations for the year. Sure. So we're suspending it this year. So we actually will be here. Okay, we'll, we'll be here. So. I think Leo Weekend and the Muscle Room has to make an appearance down at, at the Skeet Shoot. I would love that. Let's that do it. Awesome. Let's do it. You guys set up your tent and yeah. everything because, yeah. again, make people aware because people that come to the shoot, maybe they've never heard of Leo Weekend. So, yeah, man. Oh, let's, we're doing that it. That would be 100 We're doing it. Now, can, can random outsiders also uh, register or how does that work? How oh, do yeah. It's open to the public. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the majority of the people that sign up are firemen. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, anybody can sign up for it. And uh, I, I want to stress that you don't have to have experience shooting. Shooting, it's a fun thing, and everybody that's out there, there's there's plenty of people out there that have done it before, and it's a non-stressful type of shooting. Yeah. You know, like you're not pretending to be shooting a person or anything like that. It's little clay things that fly through the air, you know, and that's all that's that's all you're doing. It. It's a great time, you know. So, uh, one of the things that we see every year is lots of newcomers, people that have never, never done it before, and we love that because that's what we want. We want it to be an inclusive thing. Yeah. Um, male, female doesn't matter. Um, age doesn't matter. We get from eighteen up to seventies. So yeah, we uh, we love it, and uh, the more the merrier, you know. So not, let's, not let's, about the money part of it, just coming out and having a good time and hanging out. With let's us. talk about the actual fundraiser and how they how they register. So again, same thing. You. Yeah, there's links on social media and links on the website as well. Same type of scenario as buying something or making a donation. There's a specific link to register for the for the fundraiser. Uh, they can just click on that. It's a hundred and seventy five bucks, uh, but that includes breakfast, uh, lunch, ammunition. Uh, it's a hundred. It's a hundred rounds for the course. So a hundred rounds of shotgun ammunition, um, and all your targets. So and where's it held at? It's this year. It is at Peconic River Sportsman's Club, so okay. it's actually a private club. Mm -hmm. So very bougie. Oh yeah, there. very oh, bougie. Yeah, yeah. yeah the guys pay a big bu mucho bucks to be members <laughs> there. Yeah, and they uh, they were gracious enough to have us there for the first time last year, and uh, it it was a big hit because the place is beautiful. There's a little lake there, and it's just it's like being a it's being a, a, like a like a summer camp kind of environment. It sounds like it. Yeah, it's awesome. So they were gracious enough to uh, allow us to be there again this year. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a ride. It's in Manorville, mm -hmm. um, so it takes a little bit of time to get out there if you're a NASA or a city guy. But um, they're well worth it. It's just a, it's an amazing day. Uh, the weather is usually great early June. It's yep. it's it's hot, but it's not crazy hot. Right. You know, it's not the dog dog days of yeah. July. Uh -huh. So it's usually really nice weather. Uh, you know, knock on wood. My brother looking down. He always manages to provide a pretty good day for us weather-wise, and uh, the food's always great. Uh, the company's great. Uh, the raffle items are always awesome, and uh, everybody everybody has a great time. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah I hope 100 so. 100% I'll be there. Good, good. We have an event the night before, June 8th, uh, which I believe is the Beyond the Badge uh, Casino Cigar Night. Oh, right, okay. Um, okay. We met those folks recently. Yeah, they're great people also. They are, um, so shout out to Beyond the Badge, and then uh, the next day, we'll come and We'll, we'll shoot some shit. Yeah. <laughs> and a little hung over. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully I win a bunch of prizes. Yeah. So, yeah, no, so. We'll, we'll definitely make that work 100%. We'll yeah, talk to, we'll, I'll talk to Kevin about it. We'll work out the logistics. Out yeah. Before we end, again, we ask all of our guests to sure. bring something with them that they're going to donate to the Muscle Room to be part of our living museum. Yes, sir. What do you got for us? So we have the first thing that we did was the challenge coin. Um, I think most people in the first responder in the military world know what that is. Uh, I was surprised by how many people don't know what it is. Yeah. All it is is like a um, an, embl an emblem made out of metal that has two sides to it, like a coin. And that's why they call it a challenge coin. Uh, and in the military world, at least, they're used to hand to out to other people to recognize something they may have done or uh, as a sign of brotherhood. So we had these coins made up. And one side is the Myrtle's Turtles logo. Uh, and then the other side is is uh, Billy. And then the second coin that we did is a foundation coin. And this one's really cool because it's actually shaped like the logo. Uh, that's really nice, yeah. Yeah, they did a yeah, great good job good craftsmanship that. on that. Yeah. And then you got the, uh, the thin red line, the yep. thin green line, and the thin blue line. That's right. 
then technically, I guess you could also say the thin white line. The white line, I, I think, is kind of EMS. Sometimes it's purple. It kind of jumps around. But there's yellow also, I think, Yeah, there's, there's colors for everything nowadays. Yeah. But I say the, the three largest, red, red right. green, and blue. Not, not, not forgetting anybody? No, no, no. Those no, are just the those three are the, biggest. The three biggest yeah, red for, for fire, green yeah. for military, and blue for law enforcement. But corrections guys, you know, we're here for them. We're yeah. here for everybody. I, well, to me, corrections falls into law enforcement, so blue. Sure. But I know they also use gray for, for corrections right. a, a lot as well. But I, I kind of lump them in with law enforcement. Yeah, and then we did uh, we had koozies made because you got to have koozies. You got to have koozies. So we've yeah. got uh, the logo on one side and the website address on the other, uh, and then we had some shirts made up. Our first batch of shirts that we did were via Grunt Style. Love now, Grunt Style. Yeah, everybody, Who doesn't? Yeah. everybody knows Grunt Style. So I reached out to them and said, "Hey, we would let's, like uh, to do up. this, please, absolutely," and uh, worked with them, and they were awesome, and they make the best shirts. The issue for us, though, is they're a little expensive. Grunt style is expensive. Yeah. yeah but but great quality. The shirt, yeah. I mean, it's got stuff on both sleeves. Right, so that's full the, uh, color. the front. Yeah, so got turtles on the front. FDNY on the side. Yep. Got the thin red, red, thin red line flag on the back. And then yeah, on the back red. is uh, Billy's helmet, crossed axes, and then a, a quote that I had read at the bunting ceremony the day after he you died. Wanna, uh, you want to read the quote for those who can't see it on camera? Uh, sh sure. So it's a famous quote by Teddy Roosevelt, and it's called "Man in the Arena." Um, I can't, I can't actually go off of memory. No, you want, you want um, to read it? But yeah, sure. So the summary, summarized version of it is: It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And uh, yeah, I read That's that in front of the quote. news cameras. I love that. Yeah, I had it on my phone and I looked at it when I was at the firehouse for the bunting ceremony and I was like, you know what? If there's not a more perfect quote I think, yeah. to sum up my brother and first responders as a whole I think that was it yeah. so I read it and um, you know the entire firehouse was behind me and um, they all kind of got struck by that a little bit I guess so they actually had bronze plaques made up oh wow um, one for the firehouse and one for me with that on that's really cool and, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, something that sticks with me a lot um, so where were we? Oh, yeah. So that's that. And then I didn't actually have one to bring, but we also have a foundation shirt. So it has this logo. It has the foundation logo on the front. And on the back is really cool. It's actually a, a couple of pictures that were superimposed on each other. So one is a, a close-up of my brother with his fire helmet on. And then behind it is a picture of him operating the, the ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it says, Continuing a Legacy of Service, which is our, our slogan. That's great. Foundation. Awesome. And, uh, that one's awesome, too. And then same thing with the hoodies. Uh, so yeah, but what we brought for you guys today. Perfect. So the shirts, the coins. Great stuff uh, to add to the museum. A couple of pens and koozies that we just, you know, we give out. Perfect. For stuff and yeah. We could have used these pens earlier. <laughs> yeah, but listen, <laughs> we, pens we, always We were looking for a pen and we couldn't find one. Pens always come in. These handy. are great, awesome. All right, so Billy, so as we wrap this up, yes, um, what I do want to say is, uh, again, firesanddrums.org. Yes. So if anybody wants to purchase one of these badass challenge coins, T-shirts, pens, koozies, or for the for the biggest thing, register for the upcoming fundraisers. Yes. Fires, F I R E S, and A N D drums, D R U M S dot org. Fires and drums dot org. Also find them on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Yep. Uh, you definitely have a TikTok. You look like you have a face for TikTok. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going near that. Okay, fine. No TikTok. <laughs> find them on Instagram. Find them on Facebook. Go to their website. Even if you can't come out to the events, donate on the website. It's a phenomenal charity. Yes. You know, so just one last thing I want to add, uh, again, to reinforce, even though we are very fire department centric because of our history and my brother, uh, please, I want everybody to understand it doesn't matter. You know, if you're a police officer, a corrections officer, MTA, transit, Nassau, Suffolk, PD, uh, EMT, uh, EMS, whatever it is, if you are a first responder and you or your family member needs help or someone you know needs help and they're not getting it through the job for whatever reason, 
reach out to us, man. That that's this is why we're here. So just keep that in mind. That's fantastic. Yes, sir. Uh, typically, we we ask for you to say your final words, but I think you just did it. I think so I just did. I think yes. that's a great way to end it, Billy. Yes, sir. Thanks again. Pleasure. I called you. I just called you, Billy. Jesus that's Christ. Right. That's right. That's an honor. We've been talking about I'll Billy. We've been talking about Billy so much. Yeah. Thank you for coming on on the show. Thanks for um, having us, man. Th- really is, appreciate it. This, this was a really really great episode. It was also a really important episode. Um. So so thanks for coming out. It's it, it's been great. Uh, Joe, take it away.